PhD from the University of Arizona, a PhD in physics. Then he, he was a postdoc at the Institute for Astrophysics in Paris. And from there, he took a faculty position at Exeter in the UK, where he was for almost 10 years. And in 2018, he moved back to the US uh, to Johns Hopkins as the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins University. Um, so David is going to present today what is the largest exoplanet survey with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, that he's leading as a PI. And he's- co-PI. <laughs> okay, I am the co-PI. And uh, <laughs> you get the credit. And um, so he's going to present today where we are in that survey so far. Uh, thank you, David. All right, thank you, Mercedes. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I'd like to show some stuff about the Panset survey. And I think this is a very fitting place um, <clears throat> because there's a rich history, of course, here everyone knows with the uh, Harvard computers and really trying to look at the spectra of stars and over the course of trying to categorize stars and looking at many thousands of stars, you sort of can figure out how stars worked. And well, we're trying to do that for exoplanets. <clears throat> And we're at the very beginning, it's just trying to take the first spectra of planets, really try to categorize them, and try to figure out how they work. <clears throat> so an intro, what I'll talk about, I'll just very briefly talk a little bit how we use the transit method to extract exoplanet atmospheres, <clears throat> and then start to really talk about the comparative exoplanet landscape, really trying to look at multiple planets and extract sort of larger trends. And so we have a large survey on the Hubble telescope, the Panzer survey. So I'll talk about some recent highlights and sort of focus it a little bit on some of the um, results, I think, with warm Neptunes and especially lots with WASP-121b. I think this planet will be the very best planet ever to characterize with transited planets. I hope TESS finds a better one, but I wouldn't bet on it. <coughs> So, and it's a real treasure trove of info, as you'll see. <clears throat> so, but before I uh, go, I want to thank a lot of the co collaborators. This is a very large program, 498 orbits, and you sort of need a large army uh, to tackle all the data. So, um, a shout out to Mercedes. <clears throat> and also, there's a lot of students, like Munaze, who's here uh, as well, and uh, Leo. <clears throat> you know, looking at all this uh, data, too. So, trending exoplanets, how do we get spectra from these? Hopefully, people are kind of aware of this. This has been around for a while now. But when the planet passes in front of the star, if you look at the light curve, of course, there's a small dip, and you can, of course, detect that the planet's there. But some of the light will also, also filter through the atmosphere and leave its spectral imprint. So, at wavelengths where atoms and molecules absorb, in the high in the atmosphere, that'll lead to a deeper transit depth. So the real trick is to measure these transits spectra, <coughs> with spectrophotometry and then look and measure the radius as a function of wavelength and look to see where you see an extra little dip. <coughs> so if you go then and plot the radius versus wavelength, you'll get what's called the transmission spectrum. And you can really think of this as an absorption spectrum. <coughs> And it's a little bit different than most of the other kind of spectra we used to in, in uh, astronomy because you're really <clears throat> plotting distance, radius versus wavelength. And really the first thing you learn when you see a feature is the composition. So this is sort of like a cartoon of say a, a sodium line, which this was the, <clears throat> the first uh, detected element in an exoplanet. <clears throat> and a thing to note, because you're plotting radius, you then have access to a large range of the planet's atmosphere. You're not just looking at the tau equals one emission surface, you're actually looking at <clears throat> a large range through the atmosphere. So high in the core, that's sensitive to high altitudes and <clears throat> deep in the wings, you're sensitive to the lower atmospheres. And this is very powerful to have a good handle on the different atmospheric layers of an exoplanet. <clears throat> so if you could then wait, for the planet to go behind the star, you can look at the eclipse, and this is a great way to then subtract the light from the whole star and look at the emission contribution from the planet itself. <clears throat> so you play a similar game where with the eclipse, you can then 
tease out the flux of the planet. Uh, <clears throat> so throughout this whole light curve, you have the transit, you have the phase curve, and then you have the eclipse here. So this little bottom here at the bottom of the eclipse is the only time you measure this, the star itself without the planet contribution. <clears throat> so if you plot the planet contribution as a function of wavelength and look, say, in the infrared, now you can look at the emission of the planet and look at the black body temperature, for instance, and get a handle on the temperature. So already, you can see already, you can start to get a handle on composition, temperature. We're starting to learn detailed things about the exoplanet's atmosphere. Uh, a bit harder measurement, if you look in optical wavelengths, you can look at the emission or the uh, reflected light or the uh, albedo spectrum. <clears throat> and then finally, if you go and get the whole phase curve, <clears throat> then you can look at the contribution of the planet throughout the, its whole orbit <clears throat> and then get the phase curve. <clears throat> and then now you can, because some of these close-in planets are tidally locked, you can start to make maps like this, this first one from Heather uh, Knutson and collaborators looking at the emission of the spectrum around the planet. So we really started to put 3D in info <clears throat> about these planets. <clears throat> From transmission spectra, you get uh, data from high to low pressures. From phase curves, you can get longitudinally, uh, <clears throat> longitudinal information all the way around the planet. So I think this is a very powerful method uh, to really get a handle on exoplanet atmospheres. <clears throat> so <clears throat> just, <clears throat> just as a sort of illustration of the sort of um, data you can get. Here's one of the first benchmark planets, HD 189733, and the other one is, of course, HD 209458B. And you can get transmission spectra. So here is uh, optical transmission spectra from Hubble and Spitzer. So you can see water detection in near infrared, <coughs> sodium, and here's the scattering slope. And you can do this at low resolution. You could also do it at high resolution and look for water, and here's the sodium. You can detect species. <clears throat> H-alpha has been detected, water, CO. <clears throat> and here's what some of the emission and phase curve data look like. Here we're plotting the planet to star flux ratio, because that's essentially what you measure from the data. If you uh, got rid of the star, you'd sort of see this as a black body, but you can tease out some water absorption features here. And here's some of the phase curve information, where you're now looking at, <clears throat> uh, you see the brightest peak here is right before the secondary eclipse, and this is really telling you that there's winds on the planet that's sort of blowing the hottest part sort of downwind, and, <clears throat> and this is telling you something about the advection of heat from the day side to the night side. And in this case, you get pretty efficient heat redistribution in the planet. <clears throat> and here's the albedo measurement of this planet where this is of sort of in the blue region of <clears throat> You know, these are hard measurements. We only have a couple data points, but the planet looks more blue uh, than it is red, and this is probably uh, due to the clouds that you see. So, <clears throat> so you can see with all these, uh, this data, we can get a, a good handle on planets, and you can sort of see a lot of the effort that's been going on over the last uh, decade or so. <clears throat> so where are we? It's kind of amazing to look back. I mean, we're 24 years from the first detection um, of a hot Jupiter. And of course, everyone knows the Nobel Prize was partly awarded this year. And we're also celebrating the 20th year of transient exoplanets. So nice to have, <laughs> see David Charbonneau in the audience. <clears throat> and just if looking at the timeline, back then, of course, you know, you have one transient planet to look at, and over the first few years, there weren't very many. And so we're looking at really single planet studies really looking at HD 209458B and 189.723 in real depth, because that's pretty much all we had access to. But as the years have gone on, you can see how the number of transient planets has absolutely exploded to now we're in the thousands, <clears throat> thanks to ground-based surveys, especially over these years, getting very good at detecting planets, WASP, HAT, uh, <clears throat> and et cetera, and then Kepler, of course, and then now uh, with TESS. And one thing I think is, for the foreseeable future, we're going to have more transient exoplanets for these sort of studies than we're going to have for all of the other methods, certainly probably for my career. <laughs> and not only that, but a much wider mass range, because we have thousands of planets potentially to characterize, and now we're even looking down into sort of sub-Neptunes and, 
and starting to get a little bit of information on even sort of rocky sort of planets uh, too. So, I mean, to do this with direct imaging, of course, we're going to have to do a big decadal survey and get something like Louvoir, which is many years off. But we can look at some of these planets now. <clears throat> so why do comparative studies? Well, we want to do for exoplanets as was done similarly for brown dwarfs and for stars. So here's just an example for brown dwarfs that, where you can see the L to T tra transition. And you, if you take lots of spectra of brown dwarfs and just line them up by effective temperature, you sort of see a transition here from the warmer L dwarfs, which are CL dominated, to the cooler T dwarfs, which are <coughs> CH4 dominated. And so effectively, you get to see this great chemistry in action just by comparing one spectra to the other. Because, of course, things like the chemistry, these things are, um, are difficult, but you can get insight into this complex physics just through a comparative study. And so here you see just sort of what's expected with chemistry with the metal oxides and water and so forth as you go from L to T dwarfs. And what you see, in this case with brown dwarfs, largely aligns with what you'd expect uh, from chemistry. So <clears throat> when I saw plots like that, I was like, wow, that'd be great to do with, with the exoplanets. So, <clears throat> and going forward, we want to really do this statistically. And a lot of the reason is because with exoplanets, our signal to noise ratio is always going to be kind of low, especially if you talk to solar system people who get to actually touch these things. <clears throat> um, but the advantage we have is the numbers are high. So it's like this astronomy sort of advantage where well, you can't look at it very well, but maybe you can look at a lot of them and maybe tease something out statistically. One challenge is that exoplanets are extremely diverse. So it's not like stars where if you see one solar mass star, all the other ones look kind of similar. They all, there's complex physics and chemistry in each one planet, that is, certainly probably had its own migration history, its own <clears throat> um, formation history, and so that can lead to a lot of diversities. And of course, there's lots of different types of planets too, which <clears throat> um, further leads to diversity. So, <clears throat> you know, thousands of trans have been, trans exoplanets have been discovered, and we probably, to do real proper statistical comparisons, we probably need at least hundreds of these planets uh, to look at and characterize, which is a big challenge. I mean, these are tough measurements to make, but that's what we hope to do. <clears throat> so. Where are exoplanets now? So here's a diagram. Hopefully most people are familiar with the planet mass uh, versus semi-major axis. <clears throat> and you can sort of see the, all the detected planets color-coded with their eccentricity just for fun. And of course, we don't have access to all of this spectroscopically. Sort of, sort of the regions we can get spectra are either through directly imaged planets, which are over here. Of course, directly imaged, you need wide separations. And currently, you need them to be young and around A stars, so like HRA 799. But you can get wonderful spectra of the, in this sort of region. Or with transits and high resolution spectra, <clears throat> you're sort of looking at the close in planets. So here's the wonderful population of hot Jupiters, which I'll talk, <laughs> show some spectra about uh, today. And then here's this great population of super Earths and sub Neptunes and um, whatever else. And you can sort of see that. In our sensitivity is just starting to touch these sort of planets and get spectrum of them. So if we sort of make a cut, think of putting our uh, transit hats on, which planets can we really get atmospheric signals for? Now, if you make the cut at something like 100 ppm, this is just the estimated signal of that sort of annulus <coughs> that you're trying to detect, that <coughs> you get sort of these planets here, so you can already see there's a wide population of hot Jupiters. So this is the, really the first population of planets where we have sensitivity to kind of the whole population, and we can look at them in, in detail. And you can sort of see, skirting on the edge, are th great planets like GJ1214, 3470, HAT26. <clears throat> and so that's sort of the state of the art now-ish, but if you kind of look forward to something like Webb, which people think we can get better precisions for, and you make the cut more like at 10 ppm, <clears throat> so 10 parts per million, that's how good your light curve has to be to detect the signals, then you can sort of see lots of these sort of sub-Neptune slash super-Earth start to come into view. And I think going forward with Webb, this is going to be a very exciting region 
uh, to look at, but there's also other interesting science cases. Now you'll start to push out to so not just hot Jupiters, but maybe warm and even cold Jupiters. It turns out if you had a transit of Saturn, it would be very detectable with large features. The surface gravity is so low. <clears throat> so maybe Webb will even look at some sort of something closer to, to analogs with uh, our own solar system planets, gas giants. <clears throat> so where did this game really, um, so this game started with Hubble <clears throat> all those years ago with HD 209458B, but the landscape as far as c comparative planetology really changed after servicing mission four, which is about a decade ago. And the real advancement was installing <clears throat> the Whitefield camera and then fixing STIS. And so you suddenly had access to very high spectral photometric precisions all the way from the UV to the near infrared. And people have demonstrated precision on the order of 20 parts per million or, or so uh, a spectroscopy. So it became, and around this time, Spitzer went into the warm mission too, and they'd been doing lots of great work, and Hubble sort of became the preeminent exoplanet observatory as far as if you wanted some sort of exoplanet spectra. <clears throat> and there's been a lot of effort on the ground with surveys as well. So <clears throat> I can sort of summarize um, some of the early work. So there's, there was a couple of programs, one from Drake Deming looking at with a wide-field camera in the near infrared with hot Jupiters, and then um, I follow up sort of a cycle later, sort of piggybacking off his, mainly with this data, <clears throat> and we were just kind of looking at the landscape, what do hot Jupiters look like? <clears throat> and here's what the data looks like. So keep in mind, of course, this is, you know, targets chosen back in 2010-ish. So this was quite a long time ago. <clears throat> um, so here's the spectra. <clears throat> I mean, it's sort of at the quality where you could just barely start to see the features, right? It looks low resolution, kind of lowish signal to noise, but you can pick out water in most all of these planets. There's sodium detected as well, and you can sort of see potassium come in and out in some of these planets. Um, <clears throat> and also, maybe not quite a surprise, but it turns out clouds was very, clouds and hazes were very important. <clears throat> uh, and we see large diversity. So in this particular study, we sort of more or less organize these just empirically, more or less taking how high the spectra is here compared to in the Spitzer bands, and you can sort of see things line up a little bit. So if you have planets which are kind of clear sky here, and you have access to a bit larger features, and then planets where the clouds and hazes are higher, they start to cover up a lot of these features, um, molecular features. Um, and atomic features as well. So you start to see these big scattering slopes. <clears throat> well, when these spectra started to come down, I really wanted to find some sort of trends. Maybe there's a trend with equilibrium temperature or something like this. <clears throat> and I sort of beat my head against the wall for a long time, and there essentially turned out to be no trends. But, I mean, that's almost by design. You can sort of see in temperature what we have. We're, the goal, of course, when you do a first survey is just to see what's out there very broadly, and so we picked planets all across the equilibrium temperature, about one of them. So you know, it's hard to get um, trends unless there was something super obvious that fell out. So, but there's really, in this sort of spectrum, there's no strong correlations with temperature or gravity or metallicity or, or other things. So 10 planets is not really a study, a, a statistical study. So um, hopefully people keep that in mind when they're going to the next generation of surveys the Louvoirs, the Habex, you know, if you have 10 sort of Earthish like planet spectra, it might be kind of hard to make sense of it because the quality is going to be very similar to this. It's going to be just off the edge of what you can do low signal to noise, um, low uh, <coughs> sort of uh, low resolution. And in fact, some of those early studies, when I saw the Earth like planet spectra, I'm like, oh, those look a lot like my spectra. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> So please go big and make lots, get lots and lots of planets, because it will really help you. <clears throat> so as far as getting lots of planets, here's a, here's a plot I've been making for a long time, and I think it's very useful. And it's plotting the V magnitude, or you can plot any sort of magnitude, of the star versus the transit signal of one atmospheric scale height. <clears throat> 
Um, and you can do this for emission spectra too in a similar way. So planets that are sort of towards this corner, um, you get much higher signal to noise for. And of course, that's really important because with transmission spectra, if a planet, for instance, is too massive, the pressure scale height dramatically decreases, so the signal decreases, and then it becomes impossible to detect. This is why you're never going to do a transmission spectra of a brown dwarf, because the gravity is too high and the atmosphere is too compact. So some planets are better for others than this. So you can sort of see there's sort of roughly constant signal to noise um, lines. So this is sort of like the, the best targets. And right here you see HD21, 458B, 189723. These are hard planets to beat as far as theoretical signal to noise. And back in 2011, here's the sort of population we had to choose from. And sort of planets below this line, you really aren't going to do without, you know, <clears throat> a lot of effort and uh, repeated observations to make them. So you can sort of see those of those 10 planets, um, the, the ones we had to choose from, which weren't too many. <clears throat> so these, the targets get better, of course, as you get to brighter targets, so it's easier to do for good photometry with mm -hmm. brighter targets or larger atmospheric scale heights. So invariably, the hot, and hot ones get uh, observed first and also the puffy one, the ones with low surface gravity, because they get large signals. <clears throat> So, so that f first survey, this is sort of like resolution of 50, signal noise of 5. And if we fast forward to the pan set, so these were sort of shows in, in the 2016-ish sort of uh, time frame. And because of surveys like, you know, here's kelp planets, wasp planets, hat planets. There's a, <clears throat> notice that here's the green circle with the old surveys. And now we're starting to push a couple magnitudes brighter. And that's great because we get to much higher signal to noise. Now more like average signal noise of of seven and resolution of 75. <clears throat> so maybe now there's sort of a hundred of good, of the sun, maybe a hundred goodish planets uh, to look at. And of course, we're all excited for TESS and sort of here's how TESS is filling out that landscape. <clears throat> so here is taking the TOIs um, from the Southern Survey uh, back from um, September. So I'm not sure how <clears throat> many more there be uh, with the latest numbers. Um, but of course, we don't have the masses for all these, so you have to estimate a mass from uh, mass radius relations out there. So you can sort of move these points in your head, you know, by a factor of a few, because the mass is uncertain. But he, but especially in this bright area, of course, test was meant to go find bright transiting planets, uh, for instance, that Webb can follow up on. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm very excited about a lot of these bright ones because they could. They could be potentially even better than the ones that we're looking at now. And there's already a handful of candidates. I mean, I got, when I started to plot this, like, oh, wow, there could be a planet just as good as HD 209458b. Although, you have to keep in mind, there's a lot of false positives here. Um, and we look in detail at that one. It says it's probably eclipsing binary. So I was like, oh, that's too bad. But maybe some of these will, will pan out to be good atmospheric targets. So I would say people doing the, the follow up, <clears throat> they, <laughs> You know, these ones are very valuable uh, for atmospheric work, <clears throat> especially at the sort of ninth magnitude region um, where it's a bit bright for the ground-based surveys. <clears throat> well, where are we now? So <clears throat> we want to get statistics of these planets. We have a couple surveys going on. One, a large program on the VLT. Because the aperture is bigger, you can sort of go for fainter targets, and that naturally is better for these large telescopes with small field of view because you need reference stars. And then the bright targets um, going after with Hubble, which you can't really do as well on the ground. <clears throat> and we're, we'll be able to build up about 50 planets and start to look at statistical trends. So you sort of can see, see the histograms between the ground-based and the Hubble targets and mass and temperature and gravity, and hopefully we'll start to see some sort of trends when we get all the spectra to be able uh, to, <clears throat> to compare. <clears throat> all right, so what's the sort of goals of the PANSET program? This was, uh, we're looking at 20 exoplanets from sort of super Earth's a hot Jupiter size, getting emissions, mainly transmission spectra, but a few emission spectra too. And I think for exoplanets, wide wavelength coverage is really, really valuable because it gives you access to all the different sort of atoms and molecules um, in the atmosphere. <clears throat> so this is 498 orbits. This is the fourth lar 
largest allocation in Hubble's history. <clears throat> and there's sort of two major objectives. One, a regular study of clouds and hazes um, in these planets. And it turns out clouds and hazes are a major inhibiting factor to really get out, especially the molecular abundances that you want. And this optical data is very valuable to actually constrain clouds and hazes and maybe even learn something about how the physics uh, of, of clouds and hazes work in these sort of extreme environments. And the other is to look at atmospheric escape across planet types. So there's a large component, which is ultraviolet, <clears throat> which I'll talk a bit about. Um, and you can learn something about the atmospheric escape of these planets. And these are so close to their host star and so heavily irradiated, atmospheric escape is extremely important. So well, an update after three years of observing and Space Telescope having a headache trying to schedule all these transits and get, <clears throat> get, get them all at the right time, all the visits are now complete. As of August 2019, we're busy in the sort of individual target analysis space, we're looking, trying to get each spectrum out, and then after that, um, we'll have the whole set to then start the fun comparative uh, studies. <clears throat> so these are great targets for web, um, UV targets. Let's see. So here's sort of the list you can sort of see, and many of these are GTO slash ERS targets. <clears throat> so here's sort of all the targets sort of lined up with equilibrium temperature. And you can sort of, these are sort of lower mass, and you go to higher mass and higher temperatures here. <clears throat> Broadly, um, with the UV, we're really looking at escaping species for hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Um, we're looking at the new UV for sort of metals like iron. Um, and here's the optical data. We'll have optical data for all of it. So really trying to pin down the clouds and the hazes and the alkali metals. And then we have near-infrared data for all these, too, where you really want to measure the, uh, the water abundance. <clears throat> so there's sort of a natural split about in the UV with upper atmosphere escape and then the lower atmosphere with uh, <clears throat> the optical and infrared transmission spectra. <clears throat> okay, but it's nice to go revisit the old data, um, mainly because you can kind of sneak in and do some of these little holes that we're missing uh, from this old survey. So notice WAS39, at the time we had no infrared data in the near UV, and then also WAS6. Um, but we went back and <laughs> we filled in those gaps. Now this sort of trend naturally predicted a couple of things. One, <clears throat> will you see this kind of large water feature here in WAS39 because it's supposed to be more cloud-free? And then here in WAS6, where we see a large scattering feature, we should see a, a sort of muted, heavily muted water feature. It's sort of a small sort of bump. So I think this was a nice test. Can optical data like this really constrain clouds? Um, can we use it to form, inform the near infrared? So if you went and got some sort of optical spectra, could you use that as leverage, for instance, to predict something about what James Webb might see? <clears throat> so I think there's kind of some web implications. Well, what did we find? <laughs> When we looked at the WAS39, we indeed did see about the same water feature that was kind of predicted, and we even see multiple water bumps, um, which has been only been seen a, uh, once or twice. <clears throat> and then here in WAS6, we pretty much saw exactly the si muted water feature that, that we would expect. So, <clears throat> so this was great. <clears throat> we sort of confirmed what um, the sort of picture had, and um, overall, in these 10 spectra, you can detect water in about 9 out of 10 of them, and that, that's really good looking forward to Webb, because Webb should be able to regularly see features in these sort of gas giant planets. You shouldn't be clouded out very often. <clears throat> but of course, it's a bit harder than optimistically you might um, assume, and the features are typically about a third, roughly, the size of the cloud-free optimistic models. Um, but that's not too bad for web, especially as you go out to lo longer wavelengths. <clears throat> so here's some of the latest spectra we have from the PANSET program. I won't get into in, in detail about all these um, objects. We have WASP-52 here, which Munaza in the audience has uh, worked hard on. <clears throat> of course, you have to worry about spots, and so there's a um, a lot of effort to do spot monitoring and take that into account when we make these spectra, but you can sort of see there's a nice water feature. Um, 
and sort of a cloudy-ish uh, spectrum. Here's WASP 101, and this is so far the cloudiest hot Jupiter that we've seen. So, so cloudy that you can't see pretty much any water at all. And you can't just play games of high mean molecular weight because this is a gas giant. So you have to have clouds really high in the atmosphere and big clouds too to sort of block mm. out all of these features. So this will be an interesting uh, case um, <clears throat> going forward. We also have feature-rich planets like WASP 121 where you can see potentially VO features and um, other absorption features. I'll talk more about that later. And here's a, some recent work <clears throat> on WASP 79. This is important because it uh, was chosen for the G JWST ERS program where we're gonna look at this with all the modes of web to try to figure out which modes work best. And we really wanted a planet which did have features to actually study, not just a flat line. So you can play around with retrievals and stuff too and see how good abundance we can get. And indeed, there's a nice water feature detected with the, uh, with the infrared. You know, funny things going on in the optical, which we'll have more to say with the pan set. But this is gonna be a very good web target for the ERS program. And there's, stay tuned, we have lots more planets in the pipeline people are hard at work at. <clears throat> So let me shift gears a little bit um, and talk about warm Neptunes. <clears throat> so here's a nice plot from Bjorn Benecke plotting the equilibrium temperature versus planetary mass, and here's where Neptune lies. Um, and now we have detections for a few of these Neptunish sized planets. Um, <clears throat> the first one was HAT P11, and then there's also HAT 26 here. And so you see the spectrum of HAT 26 here where it was kind of surprised that we got quite a low metallicity because a priori, these sort of Neptune-sized planets, you don't really quite know what they're made out of. Are these water-rich planets? <clears throat> Are they hydrogen-helium-rich planets? Are they high mean molecular weight, low mean molecular weight? You know, you don't quite know until you go and, and measure them. <clears throat> and <clears throat> here, these first couple of measurements, had 11, you didn't quite know the metallicity very well because all you had was near-infrared data, and there's lots of degeneracies, and so you can see the error bars on the metallicity are many orders of magnitude. So you can see the water's there, but you don't quite know how much. And HAT26, with the addition of even a little optical data, it pinned it down, still sort of order of magnitude, and, but order of magnitude, we're getting sort of lower metallicities. So it didn't look like Uranus or Neptune, which had metallicities more like 100 times solar, it looked much lower. So this really pointed to some sort of um, low, <coughs> low metallicity. So high Z and low Z here, I don't mean redshift, I mean um, metallicity. <coughs> so as <coughs> here's some pan results for HATP11, adding just some optical data, and this is great work. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry, I don't have Iyadi Chichan and Heather Knutson and Caltech. <clears throat> but with a little optical data, you can really pin down the metallicity better. And so here's the posterior distributions of the data with only the wide field camera, where you can see the little water bump here in red, and then the wide field camera plus the STIS data. And you can sort of see the main thing is you can sort of rule out these are really high mean molecular, or sorry, high metallicities. And this planet does also look like <clears throat> it has low metallicity. Um, <clears throat> so. It looks more like something below about five times solar. <clears throat> and if we look at all of these planets now, 3470, HAT26, and then now K218, <clears throat> all of these sort of have low <clears throat> solar-ish uh, ab <clears throat> abundances. And of course, you know, there's large error bars, so it's hard to say this with, uh, really definitively. But it kind of looks like these are really hydrogen, helium-rich, atmospheres, we're, I mean, we're now we're going down to about um, eight-ish solar masses. And I think we start to learn things when we sort of see them at multiple angles. So Kepler, of course, how people are familiar with this is the Fulton Gap, <clears throat> looking at the planet occurrence for these small planets. Uh, <clears throat> and if you go and do this very carefully, and uh, you, you, <clears throat> you sort of see the the planet occurrence dips at about 1.8 Earth radii, and you, you get these two populations, and the best explanation, and it was kind of predicted in advance, is you have these gaseous sub-Neptunes 
<clears throat> which are basically rocks with hydrogen helium atmospheres and then the kind of rocky super earths and it's a <clears throat> process of mass loss where planets can lose their hydrogen and helium atmospheres and be stripped of that and then turn into these um, rocky super earths <clears throat> and sort of leave a gap in between because it happens quite quickly and so this is a sort of a view from the Kepler population statistics that these planets have hydrogen helium rich primordial gas atmospheres <clears throat> and um, if there are water worlds they seem to be kind of rare and so far the transmission spectra seems to point in this direction too the spectra we get are sort of pointing more towards solar-ish uh, low uh, <clears throat> uh, metallicity atmospheres but of course if there's this mass loss you'd really like to see that in action <clears throat> So this is where the ultraviolet comes in. So if you look at uh, Lyman alpha in the ultraviolet, <coughs> here's the, the Lyman alpha line <coughs> of the star. And of course, there's a lot of ISM hydrogen in the way. So you, the entire stellar line is eaten out at the core. If there was no ISM, you'd have a big whopping peak. Uh, <coughs> but all that's eaten out. And really, you're left with studying the wings of the lines. The, at redshift and blue shifted uh, velocities. And if you look at GJ3470, you actually see large 40% transit depths, which is amazing. I mean, these are small planets uh, occulting about 1% of their light in the optical. But if you look in uh, the UV, they occult 40%. So there's a large hydrogen cloud, <coughs> comet-like, tail, basically, and you can sort of see the tail here <clears throat> as these dotted lines indicate the optical transit <clears throat> of the actual bulk planet. And you can see a large tail that persists long after the transit's finished. You have, you have a long, comma-like tail of hydrogen gas. And you can see this, even in the spectra itself, the black is uh, out of transit and the green is, is in transit. So they're very large signals. <clears throat> and it's <clears throat> and if you actually calculate the mass loss for GA3470, which on the Poland gap will lie about here, it's really substantial. So this is several orders of magnitude higher than uh, GJ436, which is also a Neptune-sized planet. <clears throat> Escape rate's about 10 to 10 grams per second. And the estimates, of course, these stars are more active in the past than they are now. And it's something like up to about a third of, the, of its <clears throat> mass has been lost over a couple of giga years. And going forward, this is almost certainly going to cross this gap <clears throat> and be sort of a super Earth in the future. So I can sort of, this is sort of like a smoking gun where you can finally see this mass loss happening and really affecting the, plant, uh, the planet on a, a scale of, of even or unity of what the mass is. <clears throat> so, um, in the pan set, we're also not just looking for hydrogen, but we're looking for uh, metals as well with cost data. So here's some <clears throat> example of GG436. So this is the first one where we saw this huge comet-like tail in the STIS data. <clears throat> Again, occulting about half the light of, of the star with a long tail. And we got cost data. <clears throat> um, and cost is a lot harder to work with as far as Lyman Alpha, you have to do a lot more work to subtract the Earth's geocorona line. Um, but Leo here did a, a great job and was able to recover that as well and search for oxygen and carbon lines. Um, and that would be great to see because maybe then we could start to connect the lower atmosphere species with the upper atmospheric escape. I mean, all we have is upper limits here. Um, but keep your eyes peeled for future of <coughs> costs uh, work. So I'll shift here from sort of Neptune, sort of, sort of very hot ultra planets, <clears throat> ultra hot planets, WASP-121. So this is one of the first Pansa spectra that we got, which is now we're looking at not the transit, but the eclipse of, of the planet. <clears throat> and he, if you look between 1.1 and 1.6 microns, you actually see water emission features of the planet. So here is... Um, in red, you see the, the planet spectra <clears throat> with emission features, and then 
In purple here, you see sort of a standard brown dwarf showing the same water feature centered at 1.4 microns, but in absorption. And of course, if you see emission, that means you have hot gas on top of cold gas, and you actually have a stratosphere. So this is great. So now you can start to really look at the pressure temperature profile of the atmosphere and, and study um, this in detail. And there's, there's a long history of trying to look, do this with Spitzer, but of course when you have a, just a few uh, photometric data points, it's pretty hard. Um, but once you get spectra, you can immediately see, oh, here's a, a feature in emission. <clears throat> and, and this, a lot of these sort of first spectra really look like black bodies. When you look at the hottest planets, um, they look like kind of black bodies, but we were able to rule that out quite significantly, and we have resolved water in emission. Um, and there's a, uh, been a long uh, theoretical prediction that uh, TIO and VO are such strong absorbers in the optical, they could absorb that optical starlight at high altitudes and lead to a stratosphere, because that's the sort of you need some sort of absorber at short wavelengths to absorb high in the atmosphere to be able to um, heat up this atmosphere and give you a stratosphere. So there's sort of hints of VO in this data, um, <clears throat> but it was hard to say uh, for sure. So going back, we started to fill out this spectra more, going out to shorter wavelengths, and it doesn't really look so much like VO, but it turns out H minus has been an important opacity source and it's been kind of overlooked, even though modelers have had it in their models for forever, but um, people have sort of forgot about it until some of this new spectra came down <clears throat> and ourselves and a lot of work recently, especially last year, um, on some of the ultra-hot planets. And you, they start to look like stars, and um, H minus is important for stars, and it looks like it's important for this these planets too, and it really leads to this sort of uh, H minus continuum that sort of makes things look more like uh, black bodies. But also it's now been pointed out that these planets are so hot, dissociation is quite important, and which is ultimately at the end of the day why many have very weak emission features. So um, <clears throat> here's some of the work from the other hot uh, planets, WASP-18, HAT-7, WASP-103. <clears throat> so what does the transmission spectra look like? And so here is uh, the Panset transmission spectrum in the optical. And one thing to note, you know, people are starting to say, oh, hot Jupiters, these are boring. We've sort of looked at these. But we're still not, we still haven't seen all the spectra out there. So notice this spectrum looks a lot different than all the other ones we looked at. So hot Jupiters aren't boring yet. We haven't got to the point where we filled out the whole catalog of what they all could look like. <clears throat> So interestingly, we have hints of VO. Some of these bumps, wiggles up and down match very well with VO features. But we were looking, really looking for TIO, which we don't see. <clears throat> and there's this really strong slope here in the near UV. We postulated it could be SH that was previously predicted to may, maybe play a role. <clears throat> and this near UV absorber, <clears throat> which I'll have more to say about in a minute. Um, but sort of getting back to sort of the 3D looks into these planets, um, TESS, of course, looked at WASP-121-2, and TESS is great as far as you can just, now all these targets they have, well, many of them you can go get TESS data for and get very nice light curves. So here's um, the TESS data, of course, the transits many times because this planet is such a short overall period, <clears throat> and it was, <clears throat> you could tease out the phase curve of this planet too, and of course Tess is in the optical, so here's an optical uh, phase curve with the spectrum. Um, so Tansu Adela at MIT uh, uh, led this. Um, and it looks like because you're in the optical and it has these strong absorbers, we're really looking at low pressures, get sort of day-side temperatures of about 3,000 Kelvin, and night-side temperatures with larger air bars, but something like 2,200 Kelvin. And here's what the sort of map looks like. Um, you sort of get instant re-radiation of all of this uh, starlight. So you don't get too much of a hot spot where it has time to sort of blow down wind. A lot of this solar light's being absorbed at very high altitude and sort of instantly re-radiated. <clears throat> so that's the optical phase curve. So this is work from Tom Evans uh, down at MIT, who was a postdoc with me for a while. So he got time to go and use Hubble to stare at WASP-121 
um, for several days. So the overall period is about 1.2 days. And we have two nice long stairs where we went all the way from secondary eclipse to, through transit and back through secondary eclipse to get the full phase curve. And here's what the white light phase curve uh, looks like. And so it, <laughs> I mean, it, the emission spectra is, is whopping when you kind of look at it, you almost think you're looking at a transit, the signal, the noise is so high. <clears throat> and just for comparison, the great WASP-43, which was the landmark uh, spectroscopic phase work curve uh, with Hubble a few years ago from Kevin Stevenson and collaborators, um, <clears throat> has about half of the phase curve amplitude of WASP-121. So this is going to get very high quality uh, spectra phase curve uh, data at the end. <clears throat> and just sort of to plot some numbers of what's sort of coming down, get phase curve amplitudes of about 1,000 parts per million and the eclipse depth too. And sort of exciting thing is a night side emission uh, <clears throat> of this measured to about 100 parts per, mil per million or measured uh, plus or minus 30. And this, you need to get sort of a handle on the actual night side emission which has been hard to measure because the night side is, is quite dim. Notice the, whoops, the WASP-43 was sort of consistent with zero uh, flux on the night side, so it's hard to measure what the temperature was, but it looks like we'll be able to do it with WASP-121. And there's a small offset in the, the hot spot, so similar to the test data, it does look like it's um, a pretty inefficient heat redistribution and uh, quite a bit of um, and a small hot spot, hot spot offset. And a great thing, of course, with the phase curve is you get the transmission, you get the emission <clears throat> spectra. So we actually got four new secondary eclipses um, from the phase curve data. And then now we can go back and sort of refine the um, emission spectra that we had. <clears throat> so here's the uh, all four or five of the emission spectra measurements we have. <clears throat> And this is sort of like a peek into to James Webb where we're going to have much higher quality data. So when we first, with the one eclipse for the pan set, there's some of these features here that really wanted to fit with VO. See, they're kind of like two sigma above our best fit model. And the retrieval models, which is a flexible way to throw many models at this planet, at this data, and see what fits. And it really wanted to fit VO, but of course they had to put a lot of VO in the atmosphere, many thousands of times solar, to actually fit those data points. The model is happy to do it, but it seems pretty physically implausible. <clears throat> so when we went and plotted the, uh, the new phase curve measurements on, here they're seen in blue, and actually the measurements matched the retrieval model uh, without a lot of VO, like almost precisely. It was, it was amazing, all these sort of features what's kind of look like VO or probably just, you know, statistical fluctuations, um, which, I mean, that's what you get when you, you know, have super high quality uh, exoplanet data. <clears throat> so it doesn't look like the, there is features here, but we do very robustly see uh, the water emission uh, <clears throat> feature. So, <clears throat> yeah. so this planet, um, yeah, it has lots of H minus, and at high altitudes, you have lots of dissociation from things like water because um, it's getting so hot and it, a definite stratosphere. So this, I think, is a very, going forward, a very rich spectrum to, to study these sort of processes. <clears throat> well, let's switch gears a little bit. The same planet, but look in the near ultraviolet, there was that question of what's going on in the near UV with that really strong slope. Well. The great thing about PANSET is we have very wide wavelengths. We also looked at this with the near UV <coughs> mode of STIS as well, which really hasn't been a very widely used mode on STIS at all. So this is high resolution data, um, resolution of uh, about 30,000 from about 2,300 angstroms to 3,000. And the nice thing is it covers lots of fun atomic species like iron one, iron two, magnesium, um, which we could potentially see in the planet. <clears throat> so here's the, the, the transits of, those, of, of this, uh, uh, this data. And I was quite happy to see near photon-limited, uh, near ultraviolet uh, 
transits <coughs> from this. And if you look at the transit depth, here's this optical spectrum which may show VO and stuff, and this was that large sort of spike in the near ultraviolet that maybe that was SH. Well, in the near UV, it really jumps up. So here's the transit depth, 1.4% roughly for the bulk of the planet. Now we get two, two and a half percent. I mean, this is very strong absorption in the near ultraviolet. <clears throat> and if you actually take, because you have many thousands of, of pixels you have at high resolution, you can get a high resolution spectra and right away popped out iron two and magnesium two. <clears throat> And this is great because not just one line, but a whole forest of lines. And of course, in other fields of astronomy, people use these lines to diagnose non-LTE conditions because of lots of lines, like in the AGNs and so forth. You have lots of spectral lines of, <coughs> that are sensitive to um, <coughs> you know, different level populations. And you, by which lines show up and which ones don't, you can sort of maybe back out uh, the conditions like the electron density and abundances and temperatures and so forth of these very upper atmospheric tenuous conditions. So this is something we're hoping to do uh, in the future. And of course, um, these are ionized species as well, so there's a possibility they could be sort of sensitive to the magnetic field uh, as well, which is um, intriguing thought. <clears throat> the amazing thing is these lines are so strong, if we actually look at <clears throat> the Roche lobe of the planet, it's about here. So we have these iron lines and magnesium lines even found on the planet, but beyond the Roche lobe. So <clears throat> in this re region, of course, the stellar gravity dominates. So um, <clears throat> we have pretty much ironclad proof that um, the hydrodynamic escape measures mechanism, which basically is um, all this hydrogen and helium is being lost, but it's dragging very efficiently the iron and magnesium with it all the way out to space, and you can see it um, beyond the rush lobe of the planet. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a definitely an important escape process mechanism, and I hope observations like this will be able to pin down the models about how hydrodynamic escape uh, works and maybe say something about magnetically controlled outflow if you know the magnetic fields on these planets are really strong. <clears throat> and hope, I'd like to see things like a cometary iron-like tail too, um, but we're not quite there yet. <clears throat> so, of course, it's great to have lots of measurements. Here is a work recently submitted a few days ago by Neil Gibson where uh, he looked at high resolution uh, with VLT UVs um, on the ground in the blue optical. <clears throat> and actually, you can tease out uh, iron one in the spectrum, <clears throat> and this is seen really in the lower atmosphere. So now we're getting a picture of iron one um, is sort of forms in the low atmosphere, and as you go higher altitudes, you're getting to larger, higher temperatures as the XUV radiations really get absorbed at those upper levels and started to lead to higher ionization states. So here's a plot, not for 121, but somewhat similar, very ultra-hot Jupiter. Here's pressure here. So here's um, very high altitudes, low pressures, and here's uh, low pressures <coughs> and um, uh, low altitudes. So deep down, you get iron one, and up, up above that, you get iron two. And this picture is sort of holding um, with what we're seeing in the spectrum. <clears throat> so I'm hoping in the future we can sort of combine a lot of these observations, low resolution plus high resolution, and really look at the ionization chemistry of these atmospheres. <clears throat> Interestingly, <clears throat> um, the detection of iron, we can say something about the deep interior too because of a process called cold trapping. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> So here's pressure versus temperature, and here's um, the red line was just the best fit PT profile we got when we retrieved on the emission spectra. <clears throat> but of course, we don't quite know, the, the, the sort of emission spectra is sensitive to sort of bar to millibar sort of levels, the sort of like light gray region here. Pressure is less than the bar. We don't really know what's going on in the deep interior, so everyone in the retrieval community and modeling community basically just we don't know what the deep interior temperature is, so you just set it equal to something like Jupiter, <clears throat> 100-ish K, 
and that would lead to the very large isothermal region down to thousands of bar. But if this was the case, you see these dotted lines here, these are condensation curves of things like iron and magnesium silicates. And let's say if the, if the deep interior temperature was 300 Kelvin, like this curve here, it would cross these condensation curves at depth, and you would expect magnesium silicate clouds and iron clouds deep in the, <coughs> in the atmosphere. And, and what, what would happen is all of the iron or magnesium above these levels would rain out and be stuck in these clouds. And we sort of see this in our own solar system, which is why in Jupiter, for instance, all the water is um, <coughs> sort of stuck in the deeper interiors and hard to measure. But if we will look at the spectrum and we see iron, it means that this cold trapping process is not happening or maybe it's very inefficient. So one way to do this, of course, is to raise the internal temperature. So if you raise it to about 500 Kelvin, you don't cross these condensation curves and then you can get um, gaseous iron throughout the whole planet and then it'd be available for escape. <coughs> and sort of when we're publishing this, um, there's some theoretical work by Daniel Thorngrid and Fortney and Company um, and they have a relation between the internal temperature and the equilibrium temperature of the planet. <coughs> and, it, and of course, they find that um, these internal temperatures have to be much higher for these hot Jupiters <coughs> because they're so heavily irradiated and that will lead to um, large internal temperatures. So uh, WAS-121 is about 24, 2500 Kelvin and their relation puts the internal temperature at about 500 Kelvin, and that's pretty much what we determine here from the condensation curves that the, the planet should be at about. So these hot Jupiters, um, their interiors don't look Jupiter-like, but they do look hot. <clears throat> so I'll end there. Um, I'd say in conclusion, even after 20 years, it really feels like we're just getting started to learn about what these planets are um, and look forward to look for more Panset results uh, in the future. <clears throat> and I very much look forward to this synergy with TESS, Hubble, and Webb, especially as TESS finds brighter and brighter uh, targets and we get better and better uh, spectrophone. <clears throat> and of course, Webb will be amazing for all this too. And hopefully we can get lots of spectra and do really precision comparative studies. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Um, uh, any questions from the audience? Okay. <clears throat> a far out question in one sense and a close in question in another sense. Namely, is there any indication in the reflections from the planets of reflections from the surface that can be picked out? Oh, you mean like um, what from I was the thinking of in. To, bear my soul, so to say, was whether you could pick that out and see changes with time which could enable you to perhaps get a handle on the rotation rate of the planet. Oh, this is rocky, rocky planets. Yeah, they don't have so much data <laughs> with rocky planets in that respect. <laughs> um, but if these ideas going forward, well, you really could see the rotational modulation and get the whole, yeah. So I think people are thinking about that now. But the gas giants, you know, <laughs> you know um, speck around in that sort of data. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, upstairs? Oh, thank you. Uh, great talk, David. Um, about uh, the... Um, last few slides that you showed. Uh, uh, do you have enough uh, uh, of the data to say something about the, uh, you mentioned the magnetosphere of the star versus planet, the planet part, or at least the connection between the two from the UV data you have? Not too much yet. So, <clears throat> um, so for the paper, one of the first signatures you might expect if there was some sort of magnetic field is maybe it doesn't look, the transit isn't perfectly symmetric. But of course, um, we don't have full phase coverage. 
And so, especially we don't have egress, and so we don't quite know if the transit is symmetric or not. So when I looked at the data we had, which is mostly like ingress and a bit of the bottom, you can't tell it apart. You know, it fits perfectly well with the symmetric curve and, you know, no shifts or anything like this. So it kind of looks like a normal circle, but um, we really like the rest of the data to sort of probe if that's the case. So I think that's one way we can look. And another will be the velocity structure, um, which we could definitely do a better job than I have done in, here in the paper. Once we see the detection, first you just want to get it out. But we can go back with high, like cross correlation techniques and look at the data in a bit higher resolution and maybe say something about if you see these lines um, at a high velocity or not, which maybe then you could say something about if it's magnetically trapped or not, too. So these are some things we hope to do in the future. Okay, any more questions? James. Hi, David. Um, you mentioned about WASP-121 that you see the magnesium and iron lines that mm -hmm. seem to be extending beyond the Roche lobe. I was wondering if you've also looked for hydrogen and helium lines that might be also extended, like the Lyman Alpha line, or is that WASP-121 too far away that uh, ISM absorption limits that? And then for the helium lines, whether or not you've looked in the uh, G102 Prism data for... Yeah, for WASP-121, we don't have the 102 in transit, so we, um, so we haven't looked at that. Um, it is too far to do the far ultraviolet measurements. Those are usually c sort of constrained to about 75 parsecs or so to be able to, you know, the close by system so the ISM isn't too bad. <clears throat> um, you know, looked briefly at the Balmer series in the optical, but these low resolution data, it's, it's often really hard to pick that feature, which is narrow and that's much easier to see at high resolution. So, like, high-resolution ground-based data is probably the way to search for that. But the, the ground-based stuff we have now is a bit bluer than what you'd really want to look for. So, but that should show up. I mean, KELT-9 is hotter, but it shows a lot this Balmer series. Um, almost certainly this is going to show that, too. Okay, any more questions? Leo? I'm getting my exercise done today. <laughs> so you said that for Neptune-sized planets, we basically don't know what happens in their atmospheres until we actually look at them. Um, but uh, how, in that case, how do we select the best Neptune size and sub-Neptune size planets to observe I mean, because, uh, so for instance, with Kel with uh, K218b, the planet is not actually super puffy nor super hot. Yet we do see, we, we see that it's a, an amazing target for transmission spectroscopy. So how do we select the best ones on that mass range, size range? Yeah, it's a good question. Because um, we don't know a lot. I think the Fulton Gap is a good place to start because maybe the ones on the heavy end of the Fulton Gap maybe do have hydrogen helium atmospheres. Um, I'm sure the TAC would probably buy that. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but exactly where that line is and where it is in temperature and mass and radius and all this other space, um, that's, you know, that's kind of a murky question we don't know. I think once you get down to the really other side and you have very small Trappist-like balls of rock that are you know, less than one Earth mass. It's hard to picture that one with a hydrogen helium atmosphere. Um, but we have these extremes, and uh, I think we're just going to have to kind of look in the middle to figure out where that is. Any more questions? Uh, if not, let's let's thank David. Thank you. Thank you.